the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from pastors here at the Rock. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Tonight, I'm just going to ask everybody just to go ahead and quietly take your seat. Those of you guys that are up front, you can go ahead and head back to your seats. So good to be in the presence of the Lord tonight. God is so good to us. Don't want to take another moment of the evening without making sure that before we go any further that your heart is right with God. Very clear from life, you can look around and you can see that we're not guaranteed tomorrow. It's interesting, this past year, actually this past month, two very famous people both passed away. One of them being 40-something years old, one of them being in their late 80s. No one said to them when they were born, you only have this many days, this many years. No one could have predicted that, no one could have thought that. And yet in the same month, one young and one old both left this life and went on to eternity. And the Bible's very clear. See, a lot of times people don't want to face eternity because they think that, you know, this is what it's all about. And yet, the Bible's very clear about what's going to happen when we die. We're going to go one of two places, only one of two. We're either going to end up in heaven or we're going to end up in hell. Now, I know our society, that's not a very popular thing. Nobody wants to be told that they might not make it to heaven and that they might end up in hell forever and ever. In our society, we, we've, we've gotten away from telling the truth because some people don't like it. And we don't want to offend anybody. And so we say, you know what, it's okay. You can go ahead and do whatever you want. And, you know, God's a God of love. And he's so loving and so kind and so, so gracious that, you know, you can do whatever you want. And you're still going to make it to heaven. That's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible says that heaven's a very real place and hell is a very real place. And that a loving God loves us enough to allow us free will choice. It says you can choose with your life where you're going to go, whether heaven or whether hell, because God doesn't want to be with people that don't want to be with him. God allows us the choice to choose heaven or hell. The Bible says this day I set before you life and death. Choose you this day whom you will serve. We make a choice with our lives. And hell is a very real place, contrary to what some people will tell you. It's talked about in the Old and New Testament. Jesus spoke about it. So you can't just bury your head in the sand and think that you're not going to have to deal with it. You're going to have to face the reality. Sometimes people say, well, no, but all roads lead to heaven, right? Because, you know, you just do whatever you need to do. And, and as long as you stick to your truth and, and you're true to yourself and that sort of thing, God sees that, God understands that, and God lets you into heaven. When nothing could be further from the truth. Do you think God, the creator of the heavens and the earth, the one who wrote the plan of redemption, called out the stars by name, the one who sent Jesus in the form of a man, born of a virgin, went to the cross, beaten bloody, public spectacle for all to see, nailed to the cross and was resurrected on the third day. Do you think he would go through all that and then say, yeah, whatever you want to do or whatever they want to do, that's cool, just do your own thing and and I'll see you when you get to heaven. No, he goes through all that. And then he outlines exactly for us how to get to heaven in his word. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and life. No man goes to the Father except by me. What does that mean? That means it's God's heaven. We're going to have to get there God's way. Can't get there your way. Can't get there my way. Can't get there some well-meaning church committee's way. We've got to get there God's way. Sometimes people think, well, God's way is by being good. I've been a really good person. I've done a lot of good deeds in my lifetime. My good outweighs my bad. used to be bad, but I cleaned up my act, and and now I'm good, and therefore that means I'm going to get to go to heaven, right? Wrong. You know nowhere in the Bible just say you can be good enough to get to heaven. Check it out. Nowhere. It's not there. Nowhere in the Bible does it say just be good or let your good outweigh your bad or any of that stuff. Clean up your act. It's not there. In fact, if you'd read your Bible, you'd know the Bible says that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And our goodness compared to God's goodness is like filthy rags, so it means they're going to be thrown at. Can't make it to heaven just by being good. Sometimes people say, but I was raised in church. Parents told me we were Christians growing up. They hung a cross or St. Christopher around your neck. Had you baptized or christened as a child. Went to religious classes like Sunday school or catechism class, maybe Sabbath school class. You're born in America. America's a Christian nation. Everybody born in America is going to heaven. We're not any other religions. We're not Buddhist, Muslim, Hindu. Therefore, we're Christians headed for heaven. Right? 
Wrong. Did you know that nowhere in the Bible say you're raised in church? Parents tell you you're Christian. Nowhere in the Bible does say you wear religious jewelry, attend religious classes, be baptized at Christmas as a child, be born in America that you get to go to heaven. And I don't see anywhere in the Bible that because you're not some other religion that by default God lumps you into the category of being a Christian, headed for heaven, denying your presence in hell. It doesn't work like that. Sometimes people say, but, but wait a second, Pastor, hold on, because not only when I was a child did I go to church, hey, I'm sitting in church, I mean, it's the first day of the year, I could be doing any sort of other thing, and, and yet I chose to come to church. Doesn't that mean I'm a Christian because I attend church and I consider myself to be one? So that no one in the Bible just say, sit in church service, call yourself a Christian, that makes you a Christian. It's like saying you could go to your garage, sit in your garage, call yourself a car, and that makes you a car. You can't just sit in church, call yourself a Christian, that makes you a Christian. Sometimes people say, but hold on a second, my last church, I got involved. I helped out, I carried the pastor's Bible, made decisions in that church. People thought of me as a leader. I, I taught in the Bible classes, even got a membership card to that church. Well, that's great, and I'm glad you did those things. Could you just show that to me in the Bible where your church involvement gets you into heaven? Because it's not there. Nor in the Bible say you get involved in church. You get to go to heaven. I don't see anywhere in the Bible God's looking for your membership card to a church before you can enter the gates. It doesn't work like that. You say, but I know God. I know about Easter and the resurrection and, and, and celebrate Christmas every year of my life, sing the songs. I, I could quote scriptures to you, Old and New Testament. Doesn't that mean I'm a Christian because I know God? Well, if you'd read your Bible, you know the demons believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. They're not Christians. You'd know the devil himself knows who Jesus is and can quote scriptures out of his mouth. And yet that doesn't qualify him for heaven. So everybody look up at me for a second. This is not about your head knowledge, about who Jesus is. Mental ascent towards God, knowing who he is in your head, that gets you right with God, but rather this is about your heart. Jesus made this statement to a religious leader of his day, probably better than all of us, probably attended more church than all of us, probably did more good deeds than all of us, raised up. Uh, I mean, we would have thought if anybody was going to heaven, it would have been this guy, Nicodemus. John, the third chapter. And yet Jesus doesn't pat him on the back and say, good job, man. Keep doing what you're doing. I'll see you there. No, he doesn't say that at all. He says, you want to enter the kingdom of heaven? You must be born again. Now, once again, we hear that term being born again. And we say, well, wait a second. I've seen that on TV and heard about that in movies and television, read about it on the Internet. You know, I, that's not, not something I want to be involved in. That's weird. That's crazy. That, that's, that's stupid. I've seen stuff like that, that born again stuff. And I don't want to have any part of that. Well, listen, that's because you're letting the world define what being born again is rather than letting the Bible define what being born again. What does being born again mean? Because you have to know this in order to get into heaven. That's how important this is. What does being born again mean? Well, from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, it's always meant the same thing. It means that you've given God all of your heart and that you've given God all of your life. It's just that simple. It's all or nothing with Jesus. Let me prove it to you in the book of Revelation, last book of the Bible. Jesus is speaking to a church just like he's speaking to us here in this church tonight. And he says, when I come, I want to find you hot or I want to find you cold because if I find you lukewarm, I'll vomit you from my mouth. Gross. Graphic words from the mouth of Jesus. What's he saying? Lukewarm. What's that all about? Well, it's a little in, little out, little up, little down. A little token prayer every now and again. Occasional church attendance. God is something in your life, but he's not everything. And you're not opposed to God, but you're not wholehearted for God. Listen, if that's your relationship with Jesus, you're not going to make it. How do I know that? Because think about it. Only people that are not real Christians will be ejected and rejected from the body of Christ. But let's not leave you there tonight. I love you enough to not only tell you the truth and not play games, but I'm going to give you an opportunity. In a moment, I'm going to count to three just like this. One, two, three, bang, pop my hands together. When you hear the sound of my hands pop together just like that, bang, that's your opportunity to raise your hand. What you're doing by the raising of your hand is you're saying, I want to give God all my heart. I want to give God all my life. I want to be born again, headed for heaven, denying my presence in hell. I'll see your hand go up. I'll count it. You can put it right back down. You say, whoa, 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 wait a second, wait a second. Time out. If I raise my hand, I'll, I'll be embarrassed. Mm-hmm. You might be. Let's get over that embarrassment. Because think of the trade-off. Isn't it better to be embarrassed for a moment in a safe and friendly church service like this than it is ended up going to hell forever and ever and ever and ever? No one make that trade. Listen, no one's that dumb, and yet the devil thinks you're that dumb. And that's why he's trying to push you out of this. You say, but Pastor, it feels like you're pushing me. Yeah, I'm trying to push you towards heaven because I love you. And God loves you and wants to be with you forever and ever. That's why. Tonight, come on, a moment of possible embarrassment for an eternity away from God? No way. You can get right with God in a safe and friendly place. And in fact, 
people you came with, they want you to do this. We're all excited for you. No one's criticizing. No one's judging. No one's condemning. This is just about you and God right now. Just focus on, is this me? Test yourself, the Bible says. Examine yourself to see whether or not you're, whether or not you're in the faith. Tonight, first night of 2013, what a great day to have a new beginning. What a great day to be born again. Not a physical birth, but a spiritual birth. Where you can start out this new year, 2014, the right way with God. Giving Him all of your heart and all of your life. Who should raise their hand in a moment if you've been running from God instead of to God? I'm speaking to you. Who should raise their hand if you're not sure about your salvation? Come on, tonight, make sure. Who should raise their hand if you've never done this? Never said yes to Jesus, giving Him all of your heart and life. Come on, I'm speaking to you. Or finally, who should raise their hand if you're lukewarm in this place? You know that's the condition of your heart when I described it. You can make a right relationship with God tonight. Guess what? I'm going to make it easy on you. I'm going to pray with you in your seats tonight. Okay? Not going to call you forward, nothing like that. All I'm going to do is pray with you right there in your seats. You're going to be born again. And then you'll get to be brand new believers in Jesus. Brand new, part of the family of God. From the first night of 2014. What a great way to start the year. All across the auditorium, front to back, left to right, back in the family rooms, wherever you're at, watching by television, the foyer, the Love Rock Cafe, or all over the world on the live stream. Come on, you can raise your hand right where you're at. And like I said, I'm going to pray with everyone in their seats, and you can join in that prayer tonight if you need to give God all of your heart and all of your life. Come on, you're ready to get your hands up. This is your time. This is your moment of salvation. All together, here we go. One, two, Three, let me see your hands. Just raise them up high for me. Raise them up high for me. Thank you. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Thank you. Nine, thank you. Ten, got you over here. Eleven, thank you. Twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty. Thank you. Who else tonight? Twenty wise people. Twenty-one, got you. Twenty-two, twenty-three, thank you. Twenty-four, thank you. Twenty-five, got you back there. Twenty-six, twenty-seven, twenty-eight, twenty-nine, thank you. Thirty, thirty-one. Who else tonight? Thirty-one wise people. I think I got you guys. Thank you if I already got you and you know I Thank you, 32, got you up there. 32, if you know I got you, you can put your hand down. But if you're saying, you know what, I don't think you got me. Put your hand up. Okay, got you back there. 33, thank you. 34, got you over there. God bless you. Anybody else real quick? Real quick, where are you at? Didn't already see your hand, if that's you. Who else? Back in the family room, thank you. God bless you. Got you back there. 35, thank you. All right, about 35. Wise people tonight, 36 up top there, gotcha. Anybody else real quick? Thank you down front, gotcha right there, 37, 38, 39. Oh, don't you just feel number 40 up top? There you are, number 40. Praise God, praise God. Come on, let's give the Lord a great big praise tonight. 40 wise people. Hallelujah. Now, like I said, I'm going to pray with you right there in your seats. Let's all stand in the presence of the Lord tonight because the Holy Spirit's here. He's drawn people to himself. You didn't respond to me. You responded to God tonight. And now you're going to give God all of your heart. You're going to give God all of your life. I'm going to ask everybody to bow your heads, close your eyes. I'm going to say short phrases. I want you to repeat them out loud after me if you have the ability. Those of you that raised your hand online or outside, you can pray this prayer with us. I want you to say out loud, Father God. Oh, come on, everybody say this together. Say, Father God, I come to you now in Jesus' name. And I give you all of my heart and all of my life. Come into my heart. Be my Lord and my Savior. Forgive me of my sin. Wash me with your blood. Cleanse me from the inside out. And make me brand new. Born again. Headed for heaven. Denied my presence in hell. Today, the first day of 2014, I am a Christian. I'm saved. Thank you, Jesus. Fill me now with your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Come on, let's give the Lord a great big praise. Woo! Hallelujah! Woo! Yeah!
Now listen, we want to help you start right. So we have some friends here in the church. Pastor Joel, would you just come right up here? This is Pastor Joel. And also we have some friends here. We call them spiritual personal trainers. We call them SPTs. You might hear that term thrown around too. They're basically friends in church. They want to give you some free information, some free literature you can take home and read about it. They'll talk to you about meeting up before church sometime soon, okay? They will be right over here, okay? So Pastor Joel and some of our spiritual personal trainers, friends, are going to be right up here with that information for you right after church tonight when we dismiss I want to encourage all 40 of you or maybe you didn't raise your hand but you prayed that prayer from your heart you can come and get that information right up here and then you can go out and join in some fellowship right afterwards okay thank you Pastor Joel come on let's give the Lord one more great big praise tonight <laughs> hallelujah God is good turn to somebody point at him and say happy 2014 it's going to be a great year And God get to us. Hallelujah. Well, tonight's a very special night. We've got some great things ahead of us and, and some neat things are in store. I believe that God's going to speak to us. Before we do that, we want to welcome anybody who's here at the Rock Church Moral Lowry Center for the first time. If it's your first time, just let us know that's you by simply raising your hand. We'd like to get a little brochure to you, but we can't do that until we know where you're at. So if that's you, just lift up your hand and let us know that's you. Anybody here for the first time? All right. Welcome over here. Welcome up top. Glad to have you with us. Welcome over here. Welcome on this side. Glad to have you with us. Who else here for the first time tonight? Anybody else? All right. A couple of you guys out there up front here. Okay. Right up here. Abraham's coming over to you. All right. And uh, about the rock, if you haven't already got a hold of that brochure, just wave at one of the ushers. They'll spot you and pass one down your direction. There's uh, some basic information about the rock. Like I mentioned, some of our church service times. We have 11 opportunities a week to come and encounter the presence of God, just like you just experienced right now. 11 times a week we get together English, Spanish. We have uh, deaf ministry interpretation, American Sign Language going on. We've got women's ministry starting back up next week. That's going to be great for the ladies. Girlfriends AM, 9.30 on Thursdays. Young adults ministries Friday night at 7 o'clock. They're meeting from ages 18 to 30. And my goodness, we are just rocking and rolling, having a good time. So we want to invite you back to church. And I encourage you that you've got a, a family of believers here. You're never a stranger in your father's house. And so this is your father's house and our father's house. And we just uh, so appreciate you joining us tonight. Also, you'll notice there's a welcome card from our senior pastors, Pastor Jim and Deborah Cobray. And uh, on the back side, of that, there's a little general information card. We would love for you to fill that out. You can do one of two things with that. You could either drop it in the offering bucket later on in the church service as it goes by, and that's okay. Cool thing to do is take it to the left-hand side of the foyer as you exit. Back there, there's a CD counter. If you take that card filled out, drop it off there at the CD counter, they'll give you a free copy of tonight's message, or maybe you want to hear what was going on this weekend. Pastor Jim brought a great message about having a better 2014. I would encourage you. It's faith building. Get a hold of that, and uh, it will encourage you. It will bless you. Can we give him one more great big warm welcome? Glad you guys came. Now, speaking of Pastor Jim and Deborah, they send their love. They are on the boat right now, just loving one another and being encouraged and taking some time uh, before they get into the 2014 year. They've got Bible college starting up again and some different things going on. So they snuck away, and uh, we just love them so much. But they send their love to you guys, and they're going to be back with us real soon. Now, tonight, like I mentioned, we have some great things that are in store, and one of the things that we're going to do on a night like tonight, we're going to, we're going to just talk about church, going to talk about vision, going to talk about encouragement for this next year. But one of the things that we can do is that we can look to the past and see what happened this past year to be encouraged and build faith for what God has for our future. So we put together a video, our video department did a beautiful job capturing what happened here at the Rock Church and World Outreach Center in 2013, and I would just ask that you guys just... Direct your attention to the overhead screens. Watch what happened. One of my neighbors and close friend actually lived behind me and she would always try to invite me. One day we were driving down the freeway and I saw the sign, The Rock, A Church of Flame. I had been homeless for almost a month. Something was telling me to go into The Rock. He gave an altar call and it was like, oh man, yeah, I need to do that. I need to be sure. It became a matter of either, sorry, stay in bed and stay down or 
get up. I felt loved. I felt like pe I have people that care about me. My church, my family. Well, I'll say The Rock kind of adopted me. I felt like a family as soon as I got here. This is home, and it felt so good inside just to be like, wow, I have a church that's truly where I'm supposed to be. And she told me that if you need help for food or for something, go and ask him in The Rock. If it wasn't for the whole church, they couldn't help people. Back to school bash, thousands of backpacks. You see the faces on these kids, so happy. Discipleship at the Rock, you get to see the beginning stages of what God is doing uh, in his church and how he saves people and the real the miracle of salvation. There's something about being in a company of women who can just constantly lift you up. Girlfriends can just meet you where you are, all touching area that she's in need of. There is no disclaimers to it. Breaking free is exactly what it is. You're going to break free of some things that you didn't realize were camping around you. The 25th anniversary actually was an amazing service. It spoke to my heart and when it was time for the altar call, I didn't hesitate but to raise my hand. That afternoon, me and my daughter came back for the celebration and they had tons of games and food. Everything that a kid could ever want <laughs> was here on campus. Well, during the time when Freedom for Our Future was launched, I was thinking, freedom for my future. Freedom for everybody's future, you know? I had this overwhelming joy inside of me because it meant I was bringing something. Being involved in SHIP and going to SHIP is really helps you to stay into the, the community, the, the church community, so you can continue to grow on. One of the high points was the 10 year anniversary. That was really amazing. Seeing people who came in the beginning of SHIP and people who are kind of newer now all coming together, it was really cool. Man Day was a day for all the men of the church to get together, hear the Word of God, and really come together and learn how to be men. Thanksgiving outreach, which where we passed out dozens of turkeys, and that was definitely a highlight. The marriage retreat. Good fellowship, fun. good fun. Yeah. It really Talking was. Talking about everything. We had such an amazing time at GNO this year. Oh my gosh, I came in just ready. I knew I was going to receive something awesome, but God just gave me so much more. I can't wait for GNO next year. I'm just inspired to change the world. going out with thousands of gifts, uh, gifts for uh, our wonderful residents that would otherwise go without. Some of our uh, residents haven't seen family or anyone in years. My passion for this ministry is loving people alive. He doesn't just change our circumstance, he changes our heart. This church is more than just a building, it's more than just uh, it's his family. My name is Joshua Burkhouse. Hi, my name is Renee. My name is Nicholas Phillips. And the Rock Church is our home. My home church is the Rock. The Rock Church is our home. It's our home. The Rock Church is our home. I love that. 2014. It's going to be a great year ahead of us. Can we just pray and invite the Holy Spirit to come and speak to us tonight? I'm going to get down on my knees. If you want to stand your feet, go ahead and let's just invite the Lord to come and teach us tonight. Father, we come to you tonight in the mighty name of Jesus. Lord, we're grateful, grateful for 2013, God. 
Some of us are grateful because it's over. Some of us are grateful because great things happen, God. Some, are, some of us are grateful, God, that we made through it. But Lord, above all else, Lord, we're grateful that Jesus is there in the midst of it all, God. That, Lord, you're an ever-present help in time of need. And so, God, we need you now more than ever, Lord. As we look towards the future with eyes of faith, God, Lord, be near to us. Speak to our hearts. Holy Spirit, come and be our teacher, be our guide. Lord, you said that the Holy Spirit's job was that he would show us things to come. Tonight, as we look into your word, as we open our mouths to declare the word of the Lord, we pray that you would come and speak life and vision, wisdom, direction, Lord, inspiration and encouragement, motivation and blessing, Lord, into our year, God. Lord, we know that through many trials we must enter the kingdom of heaven, and so, God, we're not afraid, but, Lord, we're strong and of good courage because you are with us. Tonight, God, open our eyes to see, our ears to hear. May we have a heart of good understanding. May we be the good ground where the word is sown. Lord, we ask your blessing on this church this year, on each and every person that attends this church or calls this their church, Lord. We bless them, Lord. Also, not just this church, God. We bless all the churches that are preaching the gospel. Lord, we, we don't think of ourselves as better than anybody else, but we see ourselves as co-laborers and workers together in your field. So, God, may this be a great year for the church of Almighty God, not just this church, but every church that's proclaiming the name of Jesus. God, bless them, build them, grow them. God, may, may there be revival in the land. God, may there be a blessing on the church of Almighty God. Lord, we give you the praise and the glory and the honor for it. In Jesus' mighty name, we're all in agreement. We say, amen. Amen. You can have a seat. Tonight, this is our New Year's celebration, 2014, and uh, it's going to be kind of a different message tonight. Myself, uh, my wonderful brother in love, brother-in-law, Pastor Luke Cobray, great man of God and part of the teaching team, and my wife, Pastor Jessica, who you already met. She was up here screaming and dancing before the Lord a little bit earlier. We're all going to bring a piece of the message tonight and also cast some vision and some encouragement for our year in 2014. I'd like to start by just kind of breaking the ice a little bit. I know we're kind of getting serious here, but you know what? Um, let's not get too serious just yet. I thought this was kind of fun. man called his parents to wish them a happy new year. His dad answered the phone and said, well, dad, what's your new year's resolution? He asked him. And he said, well, my, my new year's resolution, son, is to make your mother as happy as I can all year. He answered that proudly. And so uh, then a little bit later on, his mom got on the phone. And the son asked mom, he said, mom, what's your resolution? And she said, to see that your dad keeps his New Year's resolution. <laughs> now tonight, we're looking at 2014, looking forward to the future, and looking what God has in store for us. And I love what G.K. Chesterton said. He said, the object of a new year is not that we should have a new year. In other words, this is not what it's about. It's not about, you know, that, that we're just going to change everything and that sort of thing. It's not about the new year, that sort of a thing. It's that we should have a new soul and a new nose and new feet, new backbone, new ears, new eyes. Now listen to this part. I love this. He says, unless a particular man made New Year's resolutions, he would make no resolutions. Think about that for a second. Unless a man makes New Year's resolutions, he makes no resolutions. Unless a man starts afresh about things, he will certainly do nothing effective. See, in our life, it's easy for us on the day-to-day to get into a boring, mundane existence. Easy for us to get caught in a trap of busy where we're too busy to dream, too busy to look forward to the future, too busy to get in faith, too busy to pray, too busy to get a fresh word from the Lord, too busy to get to church. And yet God is saying, I want you to shake yourself. Times and seasons have been given to man on the earth for a reason. And God is saying to us, in this new season, this new year, this is 1-1-2014. We have a blank slate, we have a fresh page, and we are writing over the next 365 days a book that at the end of the year we will look back on and read what has been written just like we saw in the overheads of all the things and the great wonderful deeds that have been done. Now tonight, we're not here to just change every year and now we're to change. You never know what to expect. No, there's going to be some things that are staples in our life and in this church. But what we believe God is emphasizing this year is why we're here. We want to hear what is the fresh word of the Lord. What, what is it, God, that you're speaking? God, what are you doing? God, where are you going? God, because, Lord, that's where I want to go. God, what are you doing? Because, God, that's what I want to do. Lord, where you are, that's where I want to be. That's what we're doing tonight. 
Unless we rehearse things, unless we rehearse covenant and remember and reflect and get a hold of the fresh word of the Lord, we lose vision. And the Bible says without a vision, people will perish. Matthew chapter 16, I want to just bring one of the, the foundational scriptures of our church. Matthew 16, if you have your Bible, I want you to go there because I want you to know what this church is all about. See, there are certain things that will never change, and yet there are some emphasis that God brings out of the year, some things that God is lighting, God is shining the light on and saying, I want you to remember these things, or I want you to refresh these things. Or maybe, even though that's an old thing, I want you to do it in a new way. That's always a good thing. Maybe there's a, a vision or a ministry that needs to be birthed in this church, something that's going to be brought forth. And even though we've been doing it, maybe it's going to be done more effectively, or maybe it's going to be done differently. Maybe it's going to reach a new generation. And so God is saying to us tonight, church, get a hold of these things. Matthew chapter 16, and Jesus is talking to the disciples. Verse number 13 says, when Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, who do men say that I, the son of man, am? That's a very important question. I mean, think about it. Jesus already knew what people said about him. He's God. If he can read the heart, if he can read the intents of the mind, then he knows what the word on the street about Jesus is. So the question's not for Jesus. The question is for the disciples. Who do they say I am out there? If we ask that question today, you know, we would find out a lot of stuff. Oh, he's a good teacher. Jesus is all about love. Jesus was a man that walked the earth. He was a rabbi. You know, he was a good guy, did a lot of good things, led a, a rebellion against Rome, some people might say. They might say some stuff like, oh, yeah, he was a figment of, of somebody's imagination, and they made him up, and that sort of a thing. He's a fairy tale. He didn't actually do all those things that the Bible says that he did. You know, he was really just, just a man, and, and, and people liked him so they made up stories about the miracles and things like that. You can hear a whole lot of stuff today out there in the world about who Jesus is. The disciples said in verse number 14, some say John the Baptist. Some say Elijah. Others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. See, there's a lot of stories about Jesus back in that day too. A lot of stuff going around about him. Verse number 15, he said to them, but who do you say that I am? See, it's one thing to know what people are saying about Jesus. Quite another thing to say, who's Jesus to you? Is Jesus your Lord? Is Jesus your Savior? Is Jesus the boss? Is Jesus the first in your life? Is Jesus the last? Is he all that he says he is to me? Who do you say that I am? 2014, we need to figure that out. Is Jesus Lord over my year? Is He Lord over my life? Is He Lord over my time? Is He Lord over my finances? Who is Jesus to me? Is He my all in all? Is He my breath? Is He my food? Is He my nourishment? Is He my song in the night? Is He my, my, my shoulder to cry on? Is He my ever-present help? Is He my comfort and strength? Who is Jesus to me? Verse 16, Simon Peter answered and said, You are the Christ, the Messiah, the anointed one, the one who was prophesied about, the one who was to come. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. That statement right there equated Jesus with God. Basically said, You're God the flesh, the one we've been waiting for. That's who you are. Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you. You didn't get this from the word on the street. But my Father who is in heaven. In other words, Peter just had a revelation from Almighty God himself about who Jesus was. Wow. Verse 18, And also I say to you that you are Peter. He gives him a new name. Peter meaning rock. And he says, on this rock, I will build my church. Now, some people say that that meant that Peter was the one Jesus was building the church on his back. And yet that is not what Jesus was saying. He was saying, Peter, you are Peter, you are the rock. And on this rock, on the confession of who I am as Christ, son of the living God, God in the flesh, on this rock, that confession, I will build my church. And the gates of Hades, hell shall not prevail against it. Wow. 
See, that, that verse is foundational to this church. Because this church has always been about the confession of who Jesus is. We're always bringing out the word. It's always about the leading and the revelation of the spirit of God in our lives. The word and the spirit together. And it's about a prevailing church. One who's not going to put up with the junk that the devil wants to spill on San Bernardino and on our lives and on the Inland Empire and on this world. We're not going to put up with that. We're going to raise up a godly standard because we've got something from God. And now we're going to take it to a lost and dying world. And the gates of hell, we got a rescue mission right there at the gates of hell. And they shall not prevail against it. Look at the next verse. Verse number 19, and I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. See, every time we come together, we get a hold of those keys. We get a hold of the wisdom of God. We can unlock things in the spirit. God says, I've given you keys. I'll give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Binding and loosing, that's one of the keys that he gives us. He gives us authority here on the earth. He gives us power. Not just over the devil, even though the devil is included in that. He's under our feet. We can bind the devil, we can release faith, we can bind up in agreement, we can say this is what we're agreed on, this is bound up now in heaven, we're going to release some things, we're going to release finances, we're going to release faith, we're going to release the the, the gospel out of our mouth, we're going to loose the hound of heaven, the Holy Spirit on the people of God as we pray for them, we're going to release healing and blessing and and we're just going to release that. He says, I've given you those keys. We decide what direction the events on earth take with our prayers our words, and our faith. That's quite a responsibility as the church of Almighty God. And yet, God left us in His authority and said, I want you as the church to be the ruling, reigning people of God. That's why He says you are a royal priesthood. You are kings and priests here on the earth. You are to intercede on behalf of the land and you are to raise up the authority of Almighty God as a king and to rule and reign with Christ. Following his lead, following his will, his direction. But we have to enforce that. We have to bring that into existence. We have to speak it. We have to pray it. We have to declare it. We have to go forward in faith. We have to do all that stuff. Because God has given to us the keys. God has given to us his word. God has given to us those things. The church exists here on the earth to win souls and to make disciples. 2014, I want to see that in a greater way in this church. I love the video that we just saw last year. Over 9,000 people walked the aisles here at the Rock Church World Outreach Center. That's awesome. Now, the year before that was the year of the shout. Some of you guys remember that. We had billboards. We had all that kind of stuff. And we had 12,000 people that were recorded. Now, you say, that went backwards, Pastor. That, that declined, Pastor. Listen, that's okay. Here's why, because there's times of great growth, there's times of abundance, but also there's times of pruning back, there's times of of lack. The Bible says there's a time for everything. And so we're not afraid when we see numbers go down. We're not in fear about that. Because listen, winning souls and making disciples. See, because the year before, we discipled probably 800 people. This past year, we discipled over 1,000 people. So that number went up. Now you tell me which is more important, that we just win souls or that we win souls and make those souls disciples. See, and that's where we're headed as a church is not just winning souls just to pat ourselves on the back and say, look how big these numbers are. That's astounding. That's amazing. That's larger than most mega churches in America, you know, and and wouldn't we all love to just rejoice in that? And yet where I rejoice It's not just that we got someone to pray a prayer, but that we got someone who prayed a prayer and now is walking with and following Jesus on a day-to-day basis. And as a pastor, I'd be a bad pastor if I didn't care about people's life afterwards. And that's called discipleship. And so one of the things for this year is that I want to see the salvation number go up. Absolutely, I want to see that go up. I would love to see 12,000 people this next year walk the aisles and give their hearts and lives to Jesus Christ. That's 1,000 a month. I don't think that's not doable. But it is not doable unless you don't get involved. See, because if you don't get involved, I can't invite all the people. And maybe if I got Pastor Jess and me, two of us, we could only go so far. Oh, well, let's get Pastor Luke involved. And let's, let's get Pastor Jim and Deborah involved in inviting people. Let's get the church staff involved in inviting people. You know, we'll only go so far. We only have so much time and so much influence. 
But when we get the thousands of people here at the Rock Church and World Outreach Center every week, every month, all year long, out there equipped to go out there and do the work of the ministry and to tell someone about Jesus, invite someone to church, now we have set the stage for there to be great growth in the church and great blessing and to see these altars filled every church service. But not only that, not only that, look at what Jesus said. Matthew chapter 28, you're there in Matthew 16. Turn to the end of the book of Matthew now. Right there at the very end of the book of Matthew. Matthew chapter 28, let's take a look at what Jesus said. Matthew chapter 28, starting in verse number 18. We'll read through the end of verse number 20. Take a look at what it says. Matthew 28, verse number 18. And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Verse number 19, go therefore, or in other words, because I have all authority, now I am transferring to you, conferring upon you the kingdom of God and saying to you, go therefore in that authority. Look at what he says, and make disciples, not just win souls, but make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. See, he said the nations, one of the unique things about Southern California is that it is a melting pot. The Inland Empire in the Los Angeles, greater Los Angeles area is a melting pot. There's one of the greatest concentrations of diversity here on the planet. And this church, hopefully you see that week after week, reflects that. We've got people from the Pacific Islands up here singing. We've got people from Asia. We've got people from Africa. We've got people from South America. I mean, this church in itself looks like our region. We are making disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. Holy Spirit, verse 20, teaching them to observe all the things that I've commanded you. And lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. Church, we can't just win souls, but we've got to care enough about people's spiritual walk to make disciples. That means that some of us need to volunteer. In fact, in the month of January, we're going to be having Volunteer Month. We're going to be talking about volunteers, appreciating and loving on volunteers. We love our volunteers. Hopefully you, you get that from us, that, that we're not patting just the, the pulpit platform superstars up here on the back and say, hey, we're all, no, that's not what we're about. We can't do anything that we do unless we have people volunteering and getting involved and doing something. The backpacks don't go out. Thanksgiving dinners don't go anywhere. The Christmas gifts don't get distributed. None of what we do happens without volunteers. And so therefore, we love our volunteers. But January, we want to get more people involved. We want to get more volunteers. I would love to see that volunteer central flooded with people week after week. I'd love to see new people saying, you know what? I believe that God has put this in my hand. And I have a talent. I have a gift. I have something. Maybe you don't know what your talent is. Maybe you feel like, I don't know what I could do. They have stuff for you to do. They'll say, well, you don't know what you're going to do. Okay, cool. Well, we have stuff for people who don't know what they're going to do that we can make them do. And we will train you. And, and if you don't like it, we'll put you somewhere else. If you mess up, that's okay. Listen, that's what this is all about. Most of us didn't start where we started in this place. We started somewhere else, and then we, we found this over here, and then we kind of went, and then, bam, God locked us in. Some of us knew. I mean, some of the people in this church just know, man, I'm supposed to sing, or I'm supposed to be on the camera, or I'm supposed to be out there greeting. Some people are naturally that way. But a lot of times, people just got to get in there and do something. Put your hand to something. And watch the, the leading and the direction of God. We must do our part. So get out there and volunteer. SPT, small groups, children's, youth, outreach, ushers, greeters, parking lot, video department, etc., etc., etc. We could go on all night just reading through the ministries here that you could get involved in. And that's one of the things that I see for 2014 on a greater level. Winning souls, making disciples, volunteerism. Let me encourage you. When we look back on this year, we've done our part, 365 days from now. We take a look at what God did. The numbers, like on that video, will be astounding to us. But not to give glory to us. No, to give glory to Almighty God, who alone can save, deliver, heal, and restore. As Pastor Luke comes, I just want to pray a prayer. And will you join your faith in believing God with me for greater measure of winning souls, making disciples for a greater measure of volunteers in this church. Will you join your faith with me? Father God, we come to you tonight in the name of Jesus. And Lord, I ask you specifically right now, here in your presence, God, I ask you for over 12,000 people this year walking the aisles of our church, over 1,000 a month, God, 
We put that out there and we believe you for that number in faith, God. I ask you for over 1,200 people trained by an SPT this coming year, God. That's over 100 a month, Lord. We believe you, God. I ask for new SPTs, God. I ask for new volunteers, Lord. I ask you for people who have a heart, God, and people who have talent and skill, yes, but more so who just have the heart to serve, Lord. Faithful men and women who are filled with the Holy Spirit of God. And I pray, God, that they will be blessed and use their gifts and their talents and their abilities here in the house of God to the glory of God. And Lord, we give you thanks and praise in Jesus' name. Everybody say amen. amen. Pastor Luke. Happy New Year. I remember uh, in, in, uh, for, for many years, people would ask me, what's your New Year's resolution? And I would always say, well, my New Year's resolution is not to make a New Year's resolution. Because I would never keep them anyways. But after that comment, I think it's the truth. You know, I think that if, like what dad always taught us at the church, if you've been around for any time, any length of time at the Rock, you've always heard Pastor Jim say that what you treat as common is common. And I think that's the important thing is that, yes, January 1st of whatever year it might be, might just be yet another day in our daily lives, yet another day that goes and comes and goes. But it is an opportunity for us to take a moment and reflect, to, to look down, to write out our visions, to make resolutions, to make plans, to make goals. Because otherwise, we get stuck in the grind. We get stuck in the, the routine or the day-to-day-to-day. -to -day -to -day, and you look back and time gets away from us. I don't know if anybody's ever realized that, but it, you blink and time is gone. It just goes. And it's an awesome opportunity. I, I was just so grateful today as we were praying before service to think about that we have a blessed opportunity as a church to gather on the first day of 2014, to really set our hearts and our minds in line with what God has for us. And as we develop our goals and our resolutions, I want to encourage you, if you do make re resolutions, don't make them out of tradition or, 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 or because that's what you do, or because we sing the, you know, the old Anxiety song and all these things. No, make resolutions and make goals and, and write them down. Make a, a 2014 a, a year to do something. And as I was praying uh, it, for my inspiration, for where God has set on my heart for 2014 and where we're going with this year, there were two things, two words that came to my mind. And, and really, there was actually many words, but in order to, to sum them down into a short amount of time, I want to just put up 2 Corinthians 5th chapter, verse number 7. Very familiar verse. It says, for we walk by faith, not by sight. We walk by faith, not by sight. One of the things that God really impressed upon my own heart is things for me to focus on in the year 2014 is the year of faith. Is a year of faith. If you remember 2013, our headline, as a matter of fact, it's actually still up there behind this black curtain uh, in our freedom for our future uh, decor or whatever is still up there. It said believe. And in 2014, for me, God really set upon my heart that is a year of faith. You see, because faith sees beyond the circumstance. Faith sees beyond the present and sees the big picture in mind. And as my wife and I, we were just talking right before we came, I asked my wife, I said, what is 2013 to you? Was it a good year? Was it, a, was it just a year? Was it a hard year? Was it was a bad year? She kind of looked at me, you know, it was, it was just a year for me. It, there wasn't much that was done, you know, there was things that I wanted to do, I didn't get accomplished. And she asked me, well, what was 2013? To you. No, this is, you know, if, you, if I look back at the grand scheme of the year, 2013 was a phenomenal year for my life. I mean, as the administrator, I was the one that oversaw and planned and put together and formulated all that we did for Freedom for Our Future in that beginning months of 2013. And when we helped involve, we were involved in planning the birthday celebration. Uh, I turned 30 this year, so that was, that was a really cool uh, event to see, like, just all these different things. I, I climbed one of the, the tallest, I climbed the tallest mountain in the continental United States. I mean, something that I had been wanting to do. And I said, but you know, October, November, December, for me, there wasn't much that happened. It was just kind of like one day, one day, one day, the next day, the next day, continuing on, kind of in the grind and into the... And I says, you know, I, I, start, I told her, I said, yeah, I started to look at that and think, well, you know, 2013 was kind of like, eh, whatever. But then that's when God impressed upon my heart, no, faith doesn't look at the present. Faith looks at the big picture. Go back to January. What did you do in January? Wow, I got to sit with 1,400 volunteers and hear their hearts about the church. That was amazing. What did you do in February? Wow, I got to hear love stories and we got to teach about love and the relationships. I saw my wife for the very first time teaching our young adults ministry. What did you do in March? Wow, we started to plan and meet with the leaders of the church for freedom for our future. What did you do in April? Wow, we launched this campaign. May, wow, and going on and on and on. And all of a sudden I begin to see that faith 
sees the big picture. And 2013 for me personally ended in a lull compared to how it started. But God's pressed upon my heart that even though 2013 didn't end how it began, 2014 sees the bigger picture because we don't walk by sight, we walk by faith. And so I say that as a church, we don't look at January. We don't look what December 31st had. But now we look ahead and we keep that, that goal, we keep that optimism, we keep that hope that we have on January 1st when March 31st comes around, when Jul uh, June 24th comes around, when August 30th comes around, when November 15th comes around, random dates. We look back and we say, I have the same optimism that I did on January 1st on those days because faith sees the bigger picture. As a church... Freedom for our future. Like Pastor Dan says, listen, we are not afraid of reality. Freedom for our future and the whole process of this campaign shook our tree. And we heard complaints. We heard concerns. We saw people who said, I don't want to be around during this process. And as pastors, that breaks our heart. But I know that even though we had those, the devil tried to come in in our own lives and tell us that you should stop because people are saying more than they said the day before. And let me tell you something. Faith sees the bigger picture. And at the Rock Church and World Outreach Center, 2014 will be a year of breakthrough in my life and your life in this church because faith sees the bigger picture. We won't stop. We won't back down. We won't withdraw, but we will continue to press and press and press and press. Why? Because faith sees the bigger picture. Faith is how we live. Faith is how we fight. Faith is how we love. Faith is how we operate. And we will continue to go in that. And in doing so, 2014 will be a year, I promise, unlike anything at this church. And I don't say this church. I love my favorite thing. I have to give such credit to Monica Brianna who, and the video team who produced that year in video. Why? Because for one time, for the first time, I see it. That it's not the church, meaning the establishment. Oh, look what this building and its staff did for the community. Because like Pastor Dan says, it's not about who we're up here. We're just people. Like Pastor Jim said that one time about church. The moment I came, the church wasn't perfect. We are all just people, but the church is you and me together. And together, through faith, through the love of Jesus Christ, we fed 500,000 families. Together, we passed out over 5,000 gifts during the Christmas season. Together, we saw 800 men come together and learn what it's like to be men. Together, we saw 3,000 women come and celebrate Christmas. Why? Because it's not about the walls. The church is just, this is just a building. We are the church. And when we live and operate in faith, then all of a sudden, and God can do what He will in our lives. So we won't back down. We won't stop. We're going to move forward. That's why we're bringing back, girls, our women's conference. That's why, guys, we're throwing a mandate down and y'all better be there because 800 people was what we had last year. We're going to have more this year. That's why, youth, we're going to have a conference. That's why in the month of October, we're not just going to have a missionary come. We're going to have a month of missions, a missions conference where we will highlight the missionary effort that this church, you are participating in across the world where you will see why we call ourselves the Rock Church and World Outreach Center because faith sees the bigger picture. It's not just about San Bernardino. It's not just about the Inland Empire. It is truly about the world. And we will see that this year. So God impressed upon my heart faith. This is a year of faith. The second thing that God pressed upon my heart this, this coming year is education. Now when I say education, we automatically think to school. But when I say education, God pressed upon my heart that we as a people have got to make it a point to learn. To learn about the things of God. To learn about the will and the wants and the ways of God for our lives. So that when we are educated, we can make educated decisions and not just blind decisions based on tradition. It's not about what a man says. It's not about the teachings or the followings of one man. But it's about the teachings and the following of the Holy Spirit to show us things in the Word of God. But we have got to make it a point to get into the Word of God and study it. To live it. To operate it. To learn it. So that we can live according to what God has in store for us. 
I have a great vision for this church. For many years down the line, now, things that won't just be accomplished in 2014, but one of the biggest things that's on my heart of the Rock Church and World Outreach Center is education, starting from our children all the way through adulthood. Do you know that once in history, the great colleges and universities around this world were established by churches? Harvard, Oxford, Cambridge, the great establishments that you and I know today as prestigious colleges were once established by churches, but churches backed off the education process and gave it over to the world and now the world has influenced the, uh, the, the people around it for their process. Well, I say it's time for the church to take back education. I say it's time for the church in America and around the world to stop being so lazy that we can't pick up the word of God, to stop being so lazy that we can't share because that's a personal matter, but rather to get out there and to make informed decisions and informed conversations with people so that they have no choice but to see the gospel of Jesus Christ behind our words. So yes, it starts with our school. But it goes beyond our school to the Bible college, beyond the Bible college to training, beyond training to education within the word of God. Because when we learn, when we know, and when we are taught by the Holy Spirit, nobody can be against us. Paul the Apostle says in Romans, the eighth chapter, if God be for us, who can be against us? And my prayer for this church, my prayer for this church in Acts, the sixth chapter, there was a young man by the name of Stephen who was elected by the elders of the church to help take care of the widows. To help take care of the people that weren't being cared for. His name was Stephen. In Acts in the 6th chapter, verse number 8, it says, And Stephen was full of faith and power, and he did great wonders and signs among the people. Church, it's my prayer in 2014 and the years following that we be full of faith and power. Not our own ability, but God's power. The grace, the sovereign divine ability to get the job done on our behalf when we can't do it because it's God who works through us in us to do what his will demands of us. Through faith and power, he did great wonders and signs among the people. But look what it goes on to say. Verse number nine. Then there arose some from what is called the synagogue of the freemen, Syrians, Cyrenians, Alexandrians, and those from Sicily and Asia, disputing with Stephen Church, there will always be disputes. The very nature of the gospel of Jesus Christ upsets the condition of mankind. When they hear the word of God, the flesh will automatically get upset about it. So you know what? When you come to church and you get offended, guess what? That's the will of God because it's forcing you to look at yourself and your flesh and say, I can no longer live like this. So they came. They argued. They disputed. Verse number 10 says... They were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spoke. Think about it in our day and age. The church over the centuries, the people of God have let the will of God fall to the side because they were afraid. But when you and I speak and we speak with the wisdom of God in our lives, the education of the word of God, they cannot resist what we say because it's not stupid. It's not foolishness. It's the wisdom of God, the one who created the heavens and the earth, the one that sees all, knows all, is all, and is in all. And in doing so, we become who God has called us to be. And God really impressed upon my heart. It's not on the overhead. It all is tied together like this. In Romans, the 10th chapter, verse number 17, it says, So then, by faith, faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. The two things that God gave me, faith and education. How do they do? It comes from the word of God. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Church, when we get into the word of God and we learn, when we make it a point to learn and study and get into it, then we get faith. And when we get faith, we get the word of God. And when we get the word of God, we get faith. And when we get faith, we get the word of God. And when we get the word of God, we get faith. And all of a sudden, we can do something more than we ever thought, asked, or dreamed. Because this church is going places. And today, as, as I close my little section and I bring Pastor Jessica up to finish her spot, I'm going to pray. But I'm not going to pray my own words. I'm going to pray the prayer of Apostle Paul. So Jess, come on up. And as, as I pray, I'm just going to read Ephesians in the first chapter. This is Paul the Apostle's prayer for the church. And it's our prayer and my prayer for 2014. So I will pray over us. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, Lord, that you would give to us the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of yourself. 
that the eyes of our understanding would be enlightened, that we may know what is the hope of your calling, what are the riches of your glory and the inheritance of our, of our fellow saints. Lord, that we might understand what is the exceeding greatness of your power that works towards us who believe according to the working of your power. God, I ask in the name of Jesus that you would work in us who worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and when you uh, seated him at the right hand of his heavenly places, far above principality and power and might and dominion, that every name that is named not in this age, but also that is to come and put all things under his feet, gave him to be head over all things to the church. Lord, I thank you that you would fill your body to the fullness of you who fills all in all. God, I ask that you would help us to understand what is the, wet, the, the breadth, the width, the depth, and the understanding of your great love. Father, I thank you that you give us wisdom in this year. Lord, your word says that if anybody lacks wisdom, let them ask in faith. Lord, I ask for faith and education this year. Lord, I ask for wisdom to know what to say, what to say, when to say. Lord, I pray that new ministries be birthed out of the Rock Church and World Outreach Center. I pray that our outreaches would be more effective than ever. I pray that our missions would reach more people in 2014 than we could ever have imagined. I pray, Lord, in the name of Jesus, Jesus, that there would be more things that we do because we put our mind to it through you. And Father, I thank you for an outflowing of faith in each and every one of our life, Lord, that we can reach out and tell somebody about the love of Jesus Christ and we can see your will fulfilled in this church. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Man, that's some good preaching. I have some good men in my life, don't I? Well, I'm going to wrap it up. We talked about the church, and I believe God has put something on my heart for you. And, you know, there's no greater example than Jesus, right? We are followers of Jesus Christ. And so I'm going to take you to Luke 22:42 in the New King James. And it says, Father, if it is your will, take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. I'm going to stop there. Not my will, but yours be done. So many times we have, I myself, we've written down our resolutions and what we're believing God for, right? Every year we do that. And every year it's amazing. I find them in my Bible and I go back and, and God has always fulfilled them. He's always taken it actually to a greater level than what I believed him for. And he's never been a God that didn't answer. But I felt like God was saying that it's time for the church to awaken this year, that our souls and we are sleeping. It is time for us to shake ourselves up and to wake up, Church of God. And you know what? I wish everybody was here from Sunday morning services. I wish this place was packed because that's the way that we need to be. When the house of God, when the doors are open, we need to be running to the house of God because we know that we're going to get the education because we're going to get the wisdom that we need to go out into this world that is trying to silence us. This world is trying to Close our mouths and allow Christians to not have a word in edgewise. They're trying to demean and demine the word of God. And listen, you better wake up, Christians, because this is not going to be a church of casual Christianity. You will not be allowed to come into this house and not be convicted by God and change. So if you're sitting in those seats, you go, oh my gosh, what did I walk into? Listen, you walked into a church of flame. The Rock Church is a church of flame. We are burning inside. And I am quickening you. And I am hearing from the voice of God. And I know God has spoken this to me. That you better awaken. Start waking yourselves up. That means, how do I do that, Pastor Jess? Well, listen, here's Jesus. And he is ready to go to the cross. And he says, not my will, but yours be done. And then it says in that verse, then the angel appeared to him from heaven, strengthening him. Listen, our cry this year is not what can God do for me or what is my goal? I'm going to lose weight. No, 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 no. This is our cry, Rock Church. God, what can I do for you? God, what can I do for you? I was talking to some of the young people, and we were putting this together, and, and God just started to speak. It was one of our meetings, and I just got really firm, and I got really like, ah, oh, the Holy Spirit was just on me. And I said, do you remember the time that you were at camp? Or maybe a women's conference, or man day, or you were just in a moment with God. You were in the presence of God. And you heard God speak. And you were so caught up with what God had for you. You said, oh God, I will do anything for you, God. I would do anything. I would go to the mission field for you, God. God, I would go tell everybody I know about Jesus. And then you walk out of this room. You walk out of that, that moment. You walk away from the presence of God. And all of a sudden, we just become us. And we get a little scared when those moments come. And we get a little like, oh, oh I know I said that, but... I don't know if I'm ready for that, God. And I feel like God is saying, those things that were birthed inside of you, 
Those things that he dropped in our hearts, he wants us to redeem them this year. He wants us to awaken them inside of us. He wants our souls to stop sleeping. He wants us to wake up, church. He wants us to rise up and take a stand. He wants us to speak his name and to show love like we've never loved before. To forgive, gosh, when it's so hard to forgive. He wants us to be his followers as he was for us. He sacrificed everything for us. And this is what God is asking. Now what can God do greater than give love? I think that's where we begin. And so what I'm asking of you, I want you to read with me in Romans 12.1. And I want you to look on the overhead screen because it's in the message. I'm a girl. I go to the message version because I just like lots of words. Okay. So here's what I, here's, here we go. So here's what I want you to do. God helping you. Take your everyday, ordinary life. You're sleeping, you're eating, you're going to work, and you're walking around life. And place it before God as an offering. Embracing what God does for you is the best thing you can do for him. So what they said was, go back. You remember how Luke said that? He said, don't just look at the end, but look at the whole picture. Embrace what God has done for you. That's the best thing you could do for him. It goes on to say, don't become so well-adjusted to your culture that you, fit in, that you fit into it without even thinking. Okay, listen, Christians. This is, I, I'm going to yell on a little soapbox here. Don't look like the rest of the world. The things that God says are not okay, they're not okay. Okay? Get into your word. Get educated. Find out what God's word says so that you know what the word of God stands for. And listen, it's not going to be popular. The word of God is offensive. It is offensive, especially to this culture. That means that you might have to get thicker thicker shoulders. You might have to pull them back. You might have to be like, I know who I am. I know who my God is. And I'm going to make a stand against those that are trying to come against me, against those, that doesn't mean that you're rude or you're, you're um, fighting all the time. It means you do it in love. There's a way of doing it. Jesus didn't come at people. He loved people. He loved people to life, and that's what we're called to do. I want you to go and read it with me. Instead, fix your attention on God. You'll be changed from the inside out. God is going to do something in us, I believe, this year. As we begin to say, not God, what can you do for me? But what can I do for you? God's going to start changing us and molding us into who we need to be for him. He's going to begin to change your thought patterns. He's going to begin to change your perspective on life. He's going to begin to change the things that you do on an everyday basis. And I'm going to give you a tool to start that at the end of this. You'll be changed from the inside out. Readily recognize what he wants from you and quickly respond to it. Guys, listen. This is not like, oh, good, yeah, great message. I'm not going to even think about it until maybe later in the year and wonder what happened. No, this is tonight. This is today. This is your moment. This is your hour. This is, this is when we're starting this. Some of you start, you raise your hand, you got saved. Listen, today's the day. You are starting a new life. Some of you Christians that have been the casual Christians, you do what you want, when you want, whenever you want, because it's the first of the year, your New Year's resolution is I'm going to get myself back into church. Listen, yeah, tonight be in church, and Sunday be in church, and Wednesday next week, and Sunday night, and you find your spot. You get involved, because this is readily recognize what he wants from you and quickly respond to it, unlike the culture around you, always dragging you down to its level of immaturity. You know, Luke was talking about education. Listen, you will learn the word of God, and you will begin to be smarter. I, it's actually been a proven fact that if you read the word of God while you're in school, that you will actually become more intellectual. And I can be proof of that because I am not the smarty pants of my family. And when I went to Bible college, the more that I read the word of God, my grades were like better, better, better. Now, listen, I had to sit next to Dan and Luke, and I was in between them, and I'm like, I don't even want to know the grades on your it's a test because it's always better than mine. But listen, as I read the word, it began to stick and it began to just kind of, oh, I know that answer. and Oh, I know what God says about that. And you know what? You'll see that your mind will be quickened and you will get to know what God wants from you and you will begin to change and you will not be any more immature. You will be a full-time minister for God who's mature and healthy and somebody God can use. God brings the best out of you and develops a well-formed maturity in you. I believe that's our prayer. And so, in Habakkuk, it says, Then the Lord answered me, and he said, Write the vision, make it plain on a tablet, that he may run who reads it. This is what I want from us. We've talked about this, and we're going to call the church 
to a fast in the month of January. Right away, oh man. <laughs> Listen, to be in a fast is to humble ourselves and come under the mission of God, to deny our fleshly desires, to deny those things that have a hold of us, and to focus on what it is God needs from us. And the only way to find out what God has for you and you and you and me is to plug in and get in with God. And so, because we have funnel cake, we're going to start it at 12 o'clock tonight, so you can have your funnel cake. <laughs> and then we're going to go to January 31st. And this is my, what I'd like for you. I'd like you to get a notepad and a pen. Yes, go old school, okay? Notepad and a pen. And make that for this month. And just get ready. Because when you are like in prayer and you're denying the flesh, it's amazing how God's voice becomes like audible. And you will get droppings into your heart that will explode and then will change your direction and your path for the rest of your life. And so I believe that God has something amazing for each of you. Because if he's calling us to awaken, and if he's calling us to become who he's called us to be originally, he says, church, stop sleeping. Write it down. For those that read it can run with it. Listen, this is not just for you, but this is for the generations to come that are following you. That means you never know if your children are going to one day come across that journal, and they're going to one day get that nugget. If you're not around and you're dead, and your great-grandchildren are going to read it and go, oh my goodness, that just went off in my spirit. And it was something God spoke to you. Listen, write it down. For those that hear it will run with it. So this is what we're going to do. We're going to have a fast for 30, 30 days. You say, what does that mean? Well, some people are doing different types of fasts. Some are doing the Daniel fast. That is nothing pleasing to the eye. Now listen, I like all food, so like, I don't know. I just like nothing. So, you know, you can figure out what it is. Maybe you're like a social media, you know, person that just can't put it down. Maybe you need to fast your phone. Like maybe you need, you know what I'm saying? Like figure it out. Get with God and find out what it is that is consuming your life and is consuming you and that you cannot do without, that's what you should fast. Because then God can come in in those moments and he can begin to do a new work in you. So remember, it's not what can God do for me this year. God, it's what can I do for you. God, what is it in me that needs to be awakened and needs to be recharged and needs to do what it is that you have? So we're going to pray. And I wrote this prayer today in my own prayer time. And I felt like God was like, you need to pray that with the church. So I've never written a prayer and read it, okay? So just go along with me and hear, what, hear my heart on this. Let's just go before the Lord. Dear Father God, we ask God that not our will but yours be done, God. Let our dreams not be our dreams, but let them be your dreams. God, let our plans not be our plans, but God, let them be your plans. Let your heart's desire, God, be our heart's desire. Let your God victories be our God victories. Let your life be a living vessel and pour out of me like living water everywhere we go. Let us be your hands and let us be your feet. Let my service to our king be pleasing to your eye. This year, Lord, we are committed to be Christians with passion, with drive, with accountability. This means that we are going to love because you first loved us. That we are going to forgive so that you can continue to use us for your kingdom come. We are going to serve to be with joyful hearts to see souls saved. And we are going to pray like we have never prayed before. God, we are going to seek your face so that we can always count on being part of your kingdom. And you can count on us. And know that we are your children. And we know that the price that was paid for you, God, for us, that we can be trusted to carry the kingdom to a lost and dying world. Lord, we give ourselves to you this year, God. What is it that you need from us? What is it we can do from you? And God, I pray that as a congregation, as we commit in a fast, that God, that you would begin to speak in a way that only you can speak. That Lord, you would open our hearts bigger and louder and bolder, God, than ever before. And God, we just ask for a spirit of holiness and love to fall on our congregation. And Lord, we thank you, God, that you would just bless us as we begin to write down that, God, that whoever will come across our journals in the future, God, that our generation to generation to generation would be blessed by your words, God. And Lord, we thank you, God, that we are your children ready to go. Just tell us what it is you need from us. And everybody said, amen. amen. Now listen, as you're fasting, I kind of wanted to give you some bullet points. You go fast for what it is God wants for you to do, okay? And then, but maybe some bullet points for you to write down for the church. 
you can write down where do I belong in the church. Maybe you're not volunteering. Maybe it's time for you to start doing a piece here at this church. Where is it, God, you'd like me to be? Can you pray for us pastors? As you can see, we're in a transition. There's a lot going on. Pray for the pastors. Pray for the pastors and their families. Pray for everything that's going on with us because we would love some prayer. Freedom for our future and finances for this church. We need this church paid off. And so we just we want you guys to link up with our faith and just believe God to go above and beyond. We'd even we hope, dream, or imagine for this church. Um, we want you to link up with souls. We need growth in that area because, we, listen, this is a dying world, and we need this world to be going to heaven, and we got to do our job. So souls and growth for this church, and also signs and miracles and wonders that the Holy Spirit would just flow this year like he's never flowed before, and we just thank you for that. So if you want those, we can probably put them online and bullet point them, but just get into prayer. Find out what God has for you, and I love you. Thank you, Rock Church. Yeah. Hey, you just heard that altar call. You just wanted to give God all of your heart and all of your life. Now let me lead you simply in a prayer of inviting Jesus Christ into your heart as your Lord and Savior. In fact, why don't you just go ahead and listen to me and go ahead and close your eyes and just repeat these words after me. I'll go slow. You repeat them. Say these words. Say, Father God, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I believe that Jesus Christ is your only begotten Son, and that you sent him for me, and that he died for me on that cross at Calvary. I believe that his blood washes away my sins, that I am now a new creature in Christ Jesus. And I thank you, Lord. I receive you now and forever as my Lord and as my Savior. I'm going to turn from sin, and I'm going to turn with all of my heart and all of my life to you, Jesus, as my Lord and as my Savior. Let it be known in heaven as well as upon the earth that I am born again. I'm a child of God, that I'm saved, and I'm headed for heaven and denying my presence in hell. Thank you, Jesus. I'm alive forevermore. Love you so much. God bless you guys. Everybody just say amen and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. So talk to you later. God bless you. Bye-bye.